Hello, and welcome to Warhammer 40k podcast. This is episode number 11, in which we're talking about Watchers of the Throne by Chris Wright. I'm Jen Bozier. And I'm Carrie Honey. And we are in the room together for once mm-hmm. for Wine and Warhammer. That's right. Pinky's out, bitches. For Nurgle. No, for the Emperor, you heretic. I thought we talked about this. No, we did not. It's for the Emperor. I'm done. Apparently we're breaking up now. (laughs) Every episode, we read, we select a book from the Black Library's Warhammer 40,000 catalog, and we post the book along with some questions for our readers to ponder on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. Readers are encouraged to read along with us and then pose questions of their own and participate via Twitter or Encrypted Box channel. Remember, spoiler warning, we're going to be talking about this book in great detail from start to finish. So if you haven't read the book yet, go ahead and do that, then come back to this post so that you can follow along. We're reading The Watchers of the Throne, which was suggested to us by one of our YouTube fans. Thank you. Thank you, Random Citizen. <laughs> we love you, Random Citizen. We have, we've always had a lot of questions about why there were, what are people talking about with these demons on Terra and what was going on there and the Astronomicon going out. This book uh, would have been really useful to read like a year and a half ago. It actually describes what happens right after Cadia falls and what happens on Terra. It's ta- it takes place from three points of view, a sister of silence, Alea, a member of the Imperial Council, Tyran, not to be mistaken with Tyrion, and one of the Adeptus Custodes named Valerian. Let's dive in, shall we? All right. First off, did you like the book? I did. I, really I liked too. it a lot. I liked it a lot. <laughs> it's so weird now that I can look at you to hear your opinion. I know. Oh, right. <laughs> Poor dorks. <laughs> so I really liked it as well. I, more than once though, reading this book, I was like, oh my god, why didn't we read this book like a really long time I, ago? I was actually really mad that I hadn't read this like right after I finished reading Cadia Stands. Way before we started Dark Imperium. Way before, because there were actually some things in this book that as I was reading, I was like, oh, that's what Dark Imperium was referring to. It wasn't just, um, what was the book that we just read where they were talking about Demons on Terra, and we were like, what? Was it Apocalypse they were mentioning this? You know what? I think it was. Actually, I think it was Apocalypse. It was that or Shroud of Night, where we were really confused. Um, yeah, in hindsight, it makes so much more sense. So, I really enjoyed it. I loved the characters. Um, Alea is like one of my new favorite characters. <laughs> and the Alera X Valerian. There has to be a word for the, like a bromance? That's like a platonic, because platonic romance doesn't cover it. But there needs to be like a male and female bromance. To, like, surely the Germans have a word for this. I'm sure it's probably like five syllables long even more reason to like it. Like, come on. That's true. Um, but there has to be a word for this. They're my new favorites. <laughs> I want the sequel to be hunting and killing with Alea and Valerian. I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, we suggest, or she suggested that, I should say, to Chris. I say Chris Rate. Right, right, right. I say Chris Rate, you say right. Potato, potato, tomato. Oh, yeah. Let's call the whole thing. I guess what we could do is <laughs> ask reboot, him. Rebute. No. <laughs> Big Bute. No, it's Reboot. <laughs> anyway, Robo. she suggested it to him, and he was like, well, there is going to be a sequel, but that's not the working title. <laughs> I'm just saying you should have come to me first. I would have come up with a really good title. I'm just kidding. I'm terrible at title and stuff. Uh, she was my editor for years. She knows that. <laughs> Titles are not my forte. So, what parts of the book really stood out to you? Oh, geez. You know uh, where to begin, right? Okay, actually, I can tell you, top of my head. So, um, I lost my notes. They're either on a plane or they're at her house. Which is like five hours away from us right now. Yeah, so uh, I lost my notes, but I can tell you the first thing that made me really just like, oh my god, it was when Arks, who is the um, Inquisitor on the Council of Twelve, who mentions a blinded and delusional sorcerer named Iskander Kane. I was like, oh, oh, okay. I barked out a laugh when she was like, oh, this all kind of makes sense. I've got a blinded sorcerer named Iskander Kane. 
literally as I was reading, I was like, yes! I guess what I really appreciate about that, I was telling this to Jen and her husband yesterday, it was um, just, I really enjoyed, uh, now that I know what time, what reference of time when is when Cain is telling his story, because I already know, I wasn't sure if it was before the 13th Crusade or if it was after, because right. And now that I know that it's right before some of the things that he was saying at the end of the Black Legion, make a lot make more a lot sense. more sense when you talk about the oh yeah, he's gonna die, the emperor's gonna die. Okay, well none of that hasn't 100 percent happened, but now I understand what he was referring to. Yeah, so the one thing that I was saying as we were reading this book was that, you know when you're doing a paint by number and all of a sudden you paint in like one of those bigger colors where you're like, oh, this all makes sense now? Mm. This kind of felt like that for me because right. all of a sudden, okay, now I know when Cadia falls. Now I know when Talon of Horus is taking place slash Black Legion is taking place. Now I know when all of this is. Now I know when Gulliman gets to this place. Um, and like what it, So the big thing for me is that Reading the Horus Heresy books, my favorite, some of my favorite characters are the Sisters of Silence. If you've read Prospero Burns, you totally know what I'm talking about. I loved the Sisters of Silence. And the Sisters of Silence are so OP. Well, I mean, they're, they cast no soul shadow into the warp. Demons can't stand them. Actually, a <laughs> little note on that in a second. But they are so useful that... I've always been really shocked in the Warhammer 40k universe. For years, I've always been like, where are the Silent Sisters? Well, they've just disappeared. They mentioned having Null Maidens on the black ships. Um, there's a really great scene in one of the Gaunt's Ghost books with that when they encounter one on a black ship. Um, it's not a good scene. <laughs> it's very sad. Um, and so I was always like, where are these guys? And then all of a sudden, in Dark Imperium, there's Null Maidens everywhere. Sisters of Silence. So, what the heck? So this book explained that too. So again, it was like that color by number where all of a sudden you've colored in everything and you're like, oh, it's a jaguar. Um, I, very apt. Um, I like cats. It just, it, it explained so much for me and her character. I think most, probably most of my favorite scenes in this book involve her because she's so funny. Especially when she's dealing with Valerian and like, Valerian would say something and she's like, yes, he was very upbeat. I found it irritating. <laughs> like, it's so wonderful, all these little cheeky things she says to him. My favorite scene is when she is yelling at him in thought speak and he's just like, I understand. And that's just pissing her off even more. So she keeps getting like more and more violent with him. And then finally he's like, that map is written in Chthonian. And she just stops and is like, you can read it? You can read this? <laughs> conversation it just so quickly i love it that she's like oh rage and then as soon as he can put in that puzzle piece for her oh now i feel better about this i loved it <laughs> <laughs> and you had you had some pieces that you really liked um with I, just the council in general right yeah but all the weird things like the whole politics of the administratum just kind of fascinates me how um some mirrors you know to our current politics of course and it's just like you know just when you think that you know the bread tape and the bureaucracy can't get any worse well let the administratum show you <laughs> you have no idea um you know just a lot of the hoops it's just always just very entertaining to me when I especially stuff like this where we have Tyrion who is not a council member he's a chancellor but he's All right, since we talked in this movie earlier today so if y'all have ever seen um, my big fat Greek wedding there is a scene where the mother tells her daughter she's like you know he, the father is the head of the family but the women we, we are the neck and we turn the head where it needs to go. And that's kind of what I felt like the chancellor mm -hmm. was. He was trying to turn, Very much so. turn the head where it it needed to go. Or we, and he at first, and just honestly watching his um, demeanor change from this guy who was just always out for himself for survival. You know, what what benefited him the most? What was, mm -hmm. what could he do to, you know, keep his status quo to suddenly realizing, like, I can't be, actually have to choose a side for once, and I'm willing to stake my career yep. on it. 
Yeah, and I liked, so one thing as an aside that I loved with the council scenes was that every person they had as a council member, mm -hmm. they totally fit the part. So like when they were describing the person from ARCS and they're describing the lady from the Inquisition, I was like, <laughs> that's exactly how I pictured the councilwoman from the Inquisition being. And when they described the councilman for the assassin, uh, I can't talk you guys, the assassins of the officio assessorum, um, when they talked about him, I was like, that's exactly how I pictured this person being. And just everything, he managed to, and some of those people, like that guy only has like, what? A few lines. Three pages, maybe, right. maybe. Even then I was like, yep, perfect. You man he managed he managed to do so much with just so little to make these guys feel real and feel exactly like what's moving this for good and bad, right? At the end of the book, another really good scene that we, you and I were talking about earlier is that when Tyrion goes to visit, um, I can't pronounce his name, but he's the head. Yeah. He's the, like the, pretty much the head of the council. And that was probably one of my favorite parts though, to be totally honest, mm -hmm. was, um, him, you know, talking to Taryn, and, and he's just like, you know, we, we need to talk, we have a problem, and he was like, oh? And he was thinking, he's like, crap, how do I not know these things? Right. Like, I really lost my touch. He's like, they're like, well, because you know, Gulliman's back. He's like, uh-huh. He goes, do I have to spell this out? And he's like, I guess. You know, I guess so. And he's, he's just like, he, we can't have him here. Like, he's gonna take our power. I'm like, oh my gosh. So typical. So typical. Well, and I like that, I like, because when he says it, he's like, oh, you know, Gulliman's kind of a problem, and Tyrion's like, what? And then finally, when the guy's just like, let me spell it out. We need to get rid of Gulliman. And, you know, Tyrion's like, whoa, oh my god. And I loved, because they end that chapter with him, like, looking at him and being like, I agree. But he totally doesn't agree. And so it was just nice, like, he was still staying in his character, but mm -hmm. also changed it. He grew as a person. Friends became enemies. Enemies became friends. Everyone was richer for the experience. I loved that part. Oh, the thing I also really liked about that part was when the head of the council, he was explaining his reasons why Gulliman couldn't take over. Mm -hmm. And he basically said it was because the Primarch started the Horus Heresy. Yes. That was fascinating. I think I maybe highlighted that. I'm looking over here at my thing. Again, I lost my notes. <laughs> but I loved... There was two really interesting things about that. Um... He not says wrong. that um, he was part of the rebellion that brought us so close to annihilation, he curtailed his own power to prevent it from happening again. And just the way that that's worded, that doesn't scream, okay, he was part of the good guys. He was part of the rebellion. So even though Gulliman was fighting for the Emperor and he has, I mean, he's put together the Codex Astartes, he has been so instrumental in this new Imperium, the fact that they were just like, oh, he was part of that original rebellion. He was part of the problem. Because oh. the Emperor's sons, they were a problem. Yes. He was one of those. Therefore, he is still a problem. And really, and uh, it was an interesting point. I mean, he's not wrong. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it was, it's such a, <laughs> a scraping reason just to hold on to what power you imagine that you have. Well, and when he's talking, Tyrion looks at him, and at one point he says that his eyes were so much more, they were so much more unfocused mm. than they had been before. So it's clearly, and that was another part of this book that I loved, was just the trauma of all of these demons appearing. When they talk about uh, Tyrion and uh, Jack, when they talk about them, like their reactions to this stuff and how they're just crying and shaking because this is terrible. And one of the things that was really great is his chapters and Valerian's chapters talk about how the magma boiling up from the bottom of the ground and the sky is raining blood and all of this stuff. And then Alea's like, yeah, no, it's just a bunch of cro cracked cro concrete and this place looks like a shithole. Right, because she can't see it. Right, because she doesn't have that experience with it. Which was, to me, I thought that was so fascinating. And it was such a neat piece of it, but clearly nobody came out of this unfazed at all. Like I, I told you this, like when um, Alea lands on Terra, because she's been trying to get to Terra since so she finds the map, and the, there's that message that said you know, he calls his he calls his daughter's home. Yeah. And so she's trying to get back to Terra. And so she's like, you know, she's looking forward to it, you know, seeing like where they originally came from, and, <laughs> and then 
they get there and it's almost like she just gets out and of course they start it's very like over the top like you know they're all strapped in they're ready for battle they land the gear comes right off and they're running down the ramp yes. and she gets down she's like wow this place sucks <laughs> right i love that but she also where is that line she talks about about she talks about how when she first gets to Terra and just when she's walking through the halls and she sees how the custodians live and she sees how the councilmen live and she's just disgusted by all of them and we'll talk more about this later um but she's so angry mm -hmm. and just her anger coming through and so like it's fun once you see her see all this because in the beginning Tyrion's like look at all my nice things okay you might think this is a little ostentatious but totally fine I deserve all this and then at the end to hear her be like ew these people disgust me mm -hmm. it's like oh man she kind of I don't know she kind of felt like the voice of the the reader almost for that um right so, yeah. uh, this cool thing she was so angry and she I think she had every right to be angry you know that there were this amazing sisterhood and um she had to deal with all her life if nobody wanted to be around her because you know they could just feel this wrongness with her not having a soul and and they were like some of the most powerful beings especially back in the time of the pre horus heresy and then during the heresy and then when that was all over they basically inquisition tried to exterminate them and so they the ones who were not on the black ships just basically went in hiding so, she, you know, basically they feel used, abused, you know, why didn't anyone come and help her sisters when the, the basically the Black Legion came and destroyed everything. Uh, and the Custodes, and I love it when Valerian, you know, after being with them for a while, and he even asked her, he's like, why? Why haven't they been here this whole time? Yeah. Well, and when he says, he's like, they had no allies. None of us wanted to fight for them because... On one hand, you have the Ordos. Probably, I would imagine more than anything, the Ordo Malleus or the Ordo Hereticus because you have a lot of psychers in that group. They don't want to be around these people. These people are a direct challenge to their power. Mm -hmm. Nobody else really wants to be around these people except perhaps the Custodes. And the Custodes, they mention this a lot in Dark Imperium, but the Custodes are, they're kind of a weird bunch. And, um can't remember if I asked a question about this. Um, yes, actually, I do ask a specific question. So, kind of segging over into that, how do you feel about the custodies after reading this book? Are they merely hiding from their failures? And I don't know how I feel about the custodies after this book. They mention in the Imperium how they kind of just withdrew within themselves, and it kind of felt that way. And I don't, I like Valerian, obviously I love him, he's a great character, but I didn't like the custodies going in. I really didn't like them coming out of here. Like, they teleport in random space marines so that they can kill them. And hunt them and kill them so they can practice. And he's like, I've been to battle. Like, no. You you brought in a... You just, like, teleport people in from random places so you can hunt them for practice. And then... It's like Jean-Claude Van Damme's movie, Hard Target. Did you just... Did you just reference Hard Target? I did. I a really soft spot for the movie because I went through a phase where I had a crush on John claude Van Damme. I Anyways, think everybody did. <laughs> the 90s were a dark time. <laughs> um, yes, they were playing the most dangerous game. And um, he does have a line like, at the end of the book, which, oh, holy crap, where he says, this was our whole original purpose. Space Marines are nothing but prey to us. And I was like, oh, man. Which also I don't think really necessarily endeared them to me either. But they're kind of Valerian. They give him a personality towards the end, but they don't really get. They don't really react to anything. The, uh, the custodians are such a. So even when I read been reading the Horus Heresy, I've seen the Sisters of Silence already. I have not seen the custodians in, right. in action. Um, I know that they were kind of like of the same branch idea of the Grey Knights, the difference being that the Grey Knights have the psychic abilities. Um, but the Custodians, I always thought, were just literal. Like, they were, they were the Palace Guard. That's mm -hmm. honestly how I always, right. always thought they were the Palace Guard. So learning about them, you know, you know, 
hunting down, you know, hunting space marines for sport. The most dangerous game. Um, just, uh, that shocked me. It did. It was, <sighs> granted, they're heretics, but still, it's like, this is how you're spending your time? I guess what else are you going to do? Throne's not going anywhere. That's true. They do talk about, he does, and this also, this is what really pissed me off, too, is that as soon as Alea gets there, he's like, we were built to fight alongside them. We are supposed mm-hmm. to be in concert with the sisters. And he talks about how once Alea gets there, they instantly fall into step with one another. It's not even like a, hmm, how is this supposed to work? They just side by side by side. He speaks flawless thought mark. They have right. been passing down this tradition of these partners who they just left out to dry. Mm-hmm. I mean, I Valerian's awesome, but my whole... There was a point in the book where I was like, does he want me to like the custodies or no? I can't tell because I just didn't at all. I liked his captain. Mm-hmm. I liked him a lot. Uh, I liked him. It's, it's really weird because I'm really curious what... Um, so now that I understand, you know, where Gulliman's come from, Narc Imperium, you know, he brings that one custody. I kind of understand that custody's anger a whole lot more now. Because they have been kind of almost forgotten. They, Terrace has been forgotten. Let's let's be honest. Let's be real. I mean, they could call it the throne world, and it was like the world at the beginning, but right. there's nothing there. I mean, there's like... It, there's God, like, it sounds awful. It sounds like, like a hellscape. Like the nothing there to the point where they said, if, you know, if the trade is delayed by like so many minutes, then this many thousands, millions of people starve because they got nothing. This planet sucks. This t- Not to put the right point on it. Yeah. And when he's describing like the hives and everything, it's it's not good. It sounds worse than the haves. It does. <laughs> well, I mean, like if you read some of the Necromunda stuff, right, where these are, you know, the hive worlds and there's a few other books that I've read that take place in hives, it didn't sound as bad. Mm. I mean, just the way he describes And maybe it's because we have a point of reference to Earth now. So like when he talks about them being, you know, with like the oceans being dried up and the air just being like a total cloud, smog cloud, one mm-hmm. endless smog cloud. I guess because you know of it now, you're just like, ew, this doesn't sound good. Why do you people live here? Pick up your shit and move. Just throwing that out there. I, I asked Jen, like, why did the Emperor stay? Because Terra. Maybe, like, in their mind, it's a really nice place. I actually thought of, um, God help me, I'm about to reference Shrek. Um, Shrek, with the, the little dancing guys, and they're like, Duloc is a perfect place. I, I imagine, like, the Emperor being like, Terra's a perfect place! See, I was actually going to do a Wally reference. Yes, that's actually exactly what it reminded me of, was Wally. You know, because they were like, oh, we're going to go other places until this is fixed, and then everybody would come back and it'll just be amazing. It'll be wonderful. Spoiler alert. No, it's not. Spoiler alert. No, it's not. So, there's just, in this book, we've kind of already touched on this, but there's so much going on in this book. Um, What surprised you the most in this book? Aside from Iskander Kane? Oh, let's see. Honestly? Gulliman showing up. I did not expect that. I really because did not. I didn't. But again, they were talking about that they don't know exactly when Cadia fell because, again, the way that the messages come and plus, you know, the speed of light and all that and the distance of where mm-hmm. Cadia was. Because mm-hmm. I know that he awoke after Cadia fell. I don't know how soon after that Belisarius call and Yvrain and the Saint decided that now is the time. Which, now I'm kind of curious if the saint was there. I mean, she must have gotten a message from the Emperor, right? Um, I don't know if it works that way. Celestine didn't really answer that question either. Um, whether or not hmm, he's like actually talking to her. Because you remember Gulliman did say, it's the line that I quote a lot, is that he's like, I'm the only person who's talked to the Emperor in the last 10,000 years. Or maybe she just gets pulled or sent. You know, like when she... I think she might get sent. Like, 
you know, so when she does her revival thing, like for the millionth time, and you know, when she enters the real world, that's where she's supposed to be, and at that time, oh, it's, I'm supposed to be doing this right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just died again, because it took everything, so <laughs> I do this all over again. I get the impression, because remember they always said, um, they said, I think it was actually in Sh uh, Shroud of Night, when she first shows, people are like, oh, crap, she's here, which means that A, that's good, the Emperor recognizes our situation's dire, but she's the angel of death. The situation is dire. Yeah, our situation is dire. <laughs> like, she's like the matrix of leadership. Um, she's there to help you in your darkest hour. Um, so I don't know, maybe she just gets sent places. I don't know if she actually knows. I know she was on Cadia. And, uh, right. And I know that she was there with Gulliman. So, I don't know. I was un unclear. Um, I was surprised to see Gulliman. Just because I expected I a reference to him, but not like... Well, I didn't think he had woken up just yet. I didn't realize it was like... Right, right. Again, like we said, I don't know how long ago it was. It could have been months. It could have been years at Katie of Blue. But, you know. Anyway, I was not expecting him to be there on Terra that moment. Right. And not only that, but kind of having like a day in glory where he's the one who's up against the big arch demon of them mm -hmm. all and fighting him off. He's just kind of like, this old man still got it. <laughs> I might have had to stretch a little bit before. But. Imagine him coming out there and being like, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I, so I wasn't, in the timeline when he did show up, I was like, oh, this totally makes sense. Because I think I kind of had a grasp of when he was coming out. But I expected more of it to be like, oh, BT dubs, Gulliman's back. I didn't expect to like, it's. I didn't expect him to be there fighting. Right. Be a, be a part of all that. Actually be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Which, it was cool. I mean, yeah. all of it. My favorite thing with Gulliman was uh, when Tyrion goes to talk to them and they're like, and Gulliman and uh, what's-his-face is like, or what's-her-face are like, oof, God, this one world, man. We gotta get to this one world. We wouldn't get there in time, though. If only somebody else was already there. And he's like, oh, they already know that I sent Alea and Valerian there. Yeah, so they're in trouble then. <laughs> Gulliman's like, that's right, we'll go help them. I liked, I liked, yeah, I really liked him being in there. That one shocked me. Um, nothing really shocked me, I don't think, though. It was more of like, oh, this is when this happened. It was more just satisfying. This is when he talks to his father. It was Although more they just said satisfying. he was... I didn't expect that. They said he communed down there, they said, for many days. So, like, oh, so he and his dad, like, had a real conversation. So, they've kind of, they've referenced it. You remember in Dark Imperium, mm -hmm. he was kind of like, yeah, that wasn't a very fun meeting. And then in Plague War, he's like, yeah, it really wasn't a fun meeting because this, that, and the other thing. And he kind of goes deeper into it. And when Mortarian sees him, and Mortarian is mocking him and is like, oh, how did our talk with dad go? Um... I was kind of like, oh, so I think there's more to this conversation than, like, he's letting on so far. But then, in this book, okay, he was down there for days. There was a lot. So I have a feeling going forward, that did surprise me, actually. Because I have a feeling going on for, uh, going forward, that's going to be one of those things that Guy Haley is able to further unpack and mm -hmm. peel open and off. As we'll learn more and more that Daddy didn't love him. That's a bit too bad of boy. I still imagine him going down there and his, or going up into the throne room. You know, he has no problem getting through the barrier. Just like, hey, dad. <laughs> and being like, where the fuck have you been? Seriously. <laughs> like, oh, it's about goddamn time. Where are your brothers? <laughs> uh, pretty much. Um, so one Storm? of the things. One of the things, and we've kind of touched on this, but one of the things that I really liked was that each of these characters had a very distinct voice, mm -hmm. um, which is not an easy thing to do, because a lot of times I've read books where there's, you know, three, because it's all told from first person point of view for that character, and a lot of times you'll read books where people, it's a differing voice, but you can tell that it's really just the same person, just like a slightly different flavor. Mm -hmm. This felt very distinct, I felt, and, um... Did it fit their stations and their character? Did you think that it helped, that that first person point of view helped this? Well, yeah, well, okay. First of all, 
couldn't have done any other way with the Sister of Silence. Okay, that's true. But yes, I, you know, even though Tyrion has this disgusting job, I was understanding it from his point of view. Yes. Where it was coming. I did like that he said he wanted to go to Luna, and Jack was like, you're old and fat. <laughs> she just played it off. <laughs> and he was like, and? Like, what use are you going to be? He's like, I just need to be there. I need to see it. Um, and I love when she's like, okay. I guess I'm going to. Let's go. Um, but yeah, even Valerian, just kind of seeing his point of view and understanding the Chancellor and then understanding his captain's point of view and understanding his role in all of this before like all this even happens just what the custodians are supposed to do and what they're what they're fighting for or not fighting for to be more to be more accurate uh, but yeah I think that was all very neat except it was just told from like even just Alea's point of view because you just you wouldn't have Alea without it being from her point of view because you know she's kind of sister of someone's I take that very seriously but I don't think it would have been as good no, and I think so. One of the things about Alea is that I loved her. God, she was good, um, but she's so angry and she's so bitter. And I think had it been written from third person, so that you couldn't hear her actual inner, I am unhappy for this reason and this reason and blah she blah blah. Come off, she would have just come off as a bitch. Frankly, yes, she would have come off as very bitchy and cold. But when you read, a, well, the thing that was neat about being in first person is that she is not a cold person. She is actually, I mean, she, it actually reminded me of uh, Dorian in Dragon Age Inquisition when uh, he's talking about Taventer, and he's like, the truth is, is that we care deeply. And that reminded me so much of her, is that she's not cold, she cares, and she cares deeply. She's just very angry. And I liked it because it gave you, it gave, I felt like this was like, almost like a state of the union. So you have the guy who's in, the pol in politics, who the first, I would say, half of Tyrion's story, he's very blasé about all of it, right? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, because he's got his fine themes. Oh, and yeah. He has his role to play. And, very, almost you know, callous. He almost yeah. gets off as very callous, and then at the end, he's terrified and scared. He then becomes scared, which I felt like he was the perfect cipher for humanity in the current Warhammer 40k series, where, you know... He's scared. Everything that they knew, everything that was comfortable is gone. Mm -hmm. And then you have the sisters who are very angry. And then you have Larry, who I think if you hadn't been telling it from his point of view, he would have been very dull. Yeah. Because he is so calculated and so just, yep, well, this is a fact and that's Duty all there is to it. Yeah. yeah. Like when she's angry and she's yelling at him and he's like, I understand. Like, I think it would have come off. I think that would have come off as very cavalier, mm -hmm. but I think that was a brilliant thing from him, and it works, and it made the story feel so much, made it feel so much more personal. Yeah. Right? I because this that. was my experience in this, in this fight, not just, oh, she ran across the battlefield. So, and some of the humor, a lot of the humor gets derived from Alea being like, I rushed towards them and they saw me coming, and Valerian being like... I did not see her coming. <laughs> and with her constantly being irritated with them, it was, uh, I think a lot of that would have gotten lost mm -hmm. in third person tra translation, as right. it were. Well, even like, you know, Valerian's interpretation of the Grey Knights, mm -hmm. you know, uh, her, like they were using all these psychic powers and the Sister of Silence showed up and he's like, you could tell they were like irritated for a second. They were like, oh. But at the same time, they're like, okay, but we adapt move on because we see the benefits over them being here over anything else because then the demons yep. suddenly got ten times weaker. I loved how pissy the demons got when Alea showed up. Mm -hmm. But they were just angry and disappointed. And I did like when she talks about them killing her sisters and she's like, yeah, they were pissed because they didn't get to take her, any of our souls. Right. Right? It's not, it's not like, I didn't like it. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. It was just like one of those, huh, interesting. So, speaking of Valerian and kind of his callousness, this is such a this is such a glimpse into the state of Warhammer Forty K's politics. Um, they are, in a word, complex. Did that surprise you? The custodies? 
No, just the um, just the politics in general through Tyrion's stories. No. Nah. The state of the council, all nah. of that. <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, nah. man, no. Nah. And you know, um, how to put this with the administratum? Because it's not like a you know, and you read other modern. Uh, what I mean by modern, like current day stuff. Um, Warhammer forty k. You really don't get into them. Like the Uriel Uriel Ventress Chronicles, all six of them. You don't like out the administratum. You kind of do in the Eisenhower and Ravener, but not really. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just you just know that there's this thing in the background. It's really the Horus Heresy, where I really got to know the administratum more often. Uh, no more often, but a little better. And it was I can't remember which book it was. If it was the first or if it was the second. I think it was the first though, when the administratum, you know, was showing up on Horus's ship. And they're like, okay, so you have to start, like, you know, imposing these taxes to pay tribute. Right. And he's like, okay, these people just lost everything. Can we just, you know, chill a moment? And right. they're like, no, we need our taxes. No. We need our tribute. No. And so Horace was kind of dealing with all that. And I remember thinking, I was like, you know, that's so callous. It's like, you know, we've just conquered these people. We have removed their way of life. They're not, this is a, it was that first group of people. They were still not, they were not happy about you know being reassimilated so mm-hmm. so not only have we just you know destroyed the your world as you know it now you must pay us money to be a part of it when y'all didn't even ask to be a part of it and it was that mm-hmm. moment i was like actually it was that moment when that's what i thought was going to turn Horus. <laughs> was even <in> a <laughs> politics fair it, it, yeah I mean, him just being like, this is not what I want. Like, I didn't, because he even says, he's like, I'm not conquering these worlds for these pencil pushers to take money and food from these people. Yeah. And I could say, he's like, I think this is what's going to do it. I think this is what's going to do it because he's getting tired of the administratum. And honestly, that would probably make anybody go crazy. Uh, you know, because it's not no longer his war he's fighting. Mm-hmm. It's their war. So that's honestly what I thought. I didn't know it was going to be, you know, Peyote. No, but it did. Nobody expects. Nobody expects the peyote. No. Not at all. Um. Yeah, it didn't surprise me. It was just. It was very disheartening. Because, similarly, whenever the administratum came up, or um, it was always like as an offhanded remark, like the Caiaphas Cain books. They mentioned a handful of times. They get mentioned as like a the butt line, the punchline of a joke, right? Kind of like when we're like, oh, it's good. Like one of my favorite phrases is, it's good enough for government work. And they would say things like that, right? Because the administrative, oh my God, it's such a joke. And, um, or like what a pain in the ass it is or something like that. The Gaunt's Ghost Book mentions those too. So that was like, it was my, and I, you always want to assume that at some level they're like, no, 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 this is working. It just, you know, as the, the further down you go down the line, the more of a shit show it becomes. Um, no. No. It reminded me a lot of, I've, when you work for a major corporation, um, it's kind of like the office space joke with the TPS reports, right? It it kind of is to that point, right? So on some hand, I'm like, okay, I understand it because these guys are hurting a lot of cats. But on the other hand, it just, God, it was so petty. Everything was so petty. And the fact that they're getting in reports that Cadia has fallen, the gate has fallen, and they're all like, well, we're still kind of divided on how we should approach this situation. And I'm like, was, 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 was that one, one guy, he was like, it's never mattered what happens, this is how we've always done things. Where, and then Tyrion's like, there's nothing stopping the eye from opening. Like, you guys are not understanding, they're like, well, there's... It's what we've always done for the last 10,000 years. This is what we're going to keep keep on doing. <sighs> just to, just to make a decision. I swear to God. That was so painful when, like, they were divided half and half and they were trying to make a decision. It's like, guys, somebody, although, and I know we talked about this before, but before Cadia falls, and they're like, okay, he's attacking Cadia. The stuff coming out of Cadia is not good. And they were just like, yeah, okay, this is like the 13th time that he's tried this. We just like the last 12. 
I like that Abaddon's kind of a joke to them, too. <laughs> They're just like, you look, failure wears Terminator armor, okay? And, uh, turns out, no. <laughs> when everybody's all of a sudden, they're like, oh god, Katie has fallen. Um, oh, my husband's not here to yell Katie stands. <laughs> I thought it explained a lot, and it really did make sense with everything that we were looking at. Um, yeah, I liked it. It was a little disheartening. Um, but they made sense. Yeah. Which was the unfortunate thing about that. Um, so how did you feel, or, or sorry, the Silent Sisters absence has always felt peculiar, which I kind of, which I kind of said before, but mm -hmm. when you got to the end of this book, did you feel like you really understood why they had been missing for all this time? No. Neither. And like on one hand, they kind of gave the little like, oh yeah, we just kind of never really explained for this. explained this, or, or people, you know, they, the Inquisition kind of wanted to get rid of him, and we just kind of never really fought for them. Anyways, they're back. They're lucky that they that they were in um, that they were still recruiting and building beyond the in black secret. ships. Well, that was one thing I really thought was interesting was when Alea was on that black ship, and those sisters of the black ships were just like. Everything is just fine, and everyone else that they had saved from other, you know, hideouts were just like, "This is not fine. This is not fine." So, it, yeah, it was. And I am. So we've already seen Gulliman use them, right? Uh, and I'm really curious about like how far it goes, because you know the last time that we saw anything that was being used was with Eisenhorn and his distaff. Yep. But as you reminded me, that they had to go underground and hide from the Inquisition. Yep. Which makes me wonder, it's like, what's wrong with you, Inquisition? Like, do you just hate things you can't control? Well, yeah. I mean, obviously. And because They're dicks. And because the Cyclona and the Thema, right there in the name, you can't control them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, they're just so wholly unlikable to be around. <laughs> they're going to say they could totally take down a ship and just go and give the uh, the navigator a hug. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, just rip them right out of the warp. I uh, need a hug. <laughs> Nobody wants to hug a navigator or a null maiden. Those poor people. You'd I would actually would be closer. Actually, I actually would hug a null maiden before I'd hug a navigator. They just seem kind of gross. I have one word to say to you about that. Octavia. Anyways. <laughs> okay, I don't get that. So, you should remember the Night Lord's books because you suck. Um, right. Look, ADB is disappointed in you. <laughs> no, he's not because he likes the way I say Narcazar. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> so, here's the big thing that I want to talk about. When you think about this book, none of this is really possible. Well, it's not, not none of this is possible. That's, that's an overstatement. But, Yes, yeah, it's possible. It's called fiction. Oh my god, this changes everything. I know. Fuck. Anyways, um, so, so um, probably should mention that we have been um, doing wine tastings all day. <laughs> We've been drinking since noon. That's not an exaggeration. So, you know, this is a very informal session. It's not our usual semi professional selves. This is what Mary Berry would call an informal presentation. Wine and Warhammer, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. Um, so, the two biggest things in this book, I feel like the reveal is that map. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. So, I know where you're going with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our hero, Alea, mm -hmm. finds this map. By chance. The map. I want to make that super clear. This map is the only reason that not everybody is stranded on Terra. Because they discover the the map is very important. It's in the hands of a mid level psyker in a low level cult, kind of tangentially affiliated with the Black Legion. She just happens to find it, and then immediately gets rescued by a custody who brings her back to Earth. And of course, they speak Gathonian, so they can read it, and then put this plan into action to go and stop the Black Legion. Um, that all seems just a little coincidental. 
especially because mm -hmm. when Gullet, when Tyrion goes to Luna and he's looking at the ground, the bodies that are on the ground from Luna that uh, Gulliman has been killing, who pops up but a guy in a teal armor with a tri serpent helmet? Again, he was Alpharius. They don't even know. Like, I can imagine at some point, some guys can show up and be like, I'm the real Alpharius. And, like, six other people will be like, me too! <laughs> I don't even think they know anymore. I really don't. Like, I'm sure that there has to be some meeting where eventually they're going to be like, okay, guys, did, like, the for reals who's Alpharius really get killed or no? I don't know anymore. Oh, real Alpharius, please stand up. 20 please people stand, stand up. up. <laughs> like, I, I don't even know who I am anymore. I have to have Spartacus. <laughs> Anyways, you don't just casually mention the Alpha Legion. And I know that I, I, that's a common refrain for me because, like, in um, Dark Imperium Plague War, mm -hmm. when Fra Freighter Matthew mentions that OBG dubs, uh, my whole planet was massacred and I was the sole survivor and it was the Alpha Legion. Anyways, not important. These yeah. are not casual people. No, they everything they do is with a purpose. And so part of me keeps asking, how does the magical MacGuffin map end up in the hands, again, of a mid-level psyker in a low-level cult, tangentially affiliated with the Black Legion? How does this end up in Alea's possession? That's a lot of coincidences. The Alpha Legion likes making those coincidences. It's mm -hmm. kind of their thing. It kind of is their thing. They're really good at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've been saying this since Shroud of Night. I think they're coming home. I would be so stoked if that <laughs> happened. Like, beyond. To be like, okay, so we really were for the Emperor, just so we're clear. <laughs> Well, I have faith. And I'll figure this. I'm more of a Megan person myself. You haven't heard of him. He's a little underground. A hipster Primark. They, it's a weird thing to me. And I, I refuse to believe, because there's so many moving pieces right now in the Warhammer universe, I refuse to believe that it's just a plot device. Like, oh yeah, she found the magical map. Anyways, um, it just feels yeah, a little too intense. Too, with too much intent in it. Mm -hmm. I agree. But here's the question. To what end? What do you mean? Like, Well, so they have this map. They got this map. Mm -hmm. If somebody did plant that there for them to get, what's the end game there? Is it so that they can the Alpha Legion can basically show up and be like, anyways, let's let bygones be bygones. Let's not bicker and argue over who killed who. <laughs> Let's not bicker and argue. <laughs> it's been an awkward 10,000 years. <laughs> oh, my oh. God. <laughs> but, and I guess because we know that there's going to be a sequel, Tyrion's story felt kind of done. Yeah. He got to go and be a remembrancer for Gilliman, and then he's basically like, yes, now I've retired to my nice little room full of nice shit. And, uh, Jack is way better at my job than I probably was. And, yeah. uh, here we're good. We're good now. He declined his next re uh, rejuvenation treatment, so he's, mm -hmm. he's done. He's putting himself out to pasture. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, the next book, definitely Ilaria and Valerian. Valer Valer you know what? No, they're now a celebrity couple. They're Ilarian. Um, I'm sticking with it. No. Come at me. I will. I'm in the same room. I can. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so, or do we call them Valea? Alarian. Alarian? This sounds weird. Mm, I'm good with it. Um, so anyways, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping, at least again, it's, it doesn't have to be hunting and killing with Alea and Valerian. It should be. It doesn't have to be. Um, I would... They, I think, would be a good... Obviously, there's more story of them to tell. I'm really excited for that for the sequel, but human takes their place is Jack. Well, I'm sure they'll pick up somebody else along the way. Right? That could be. That might be interesting. I just... Where does this go from here? 
Is it just more of them hunting down stuff on that map, trying to follow, pull the threads out of that to follow back and figure out if they can figure out where the Black Legion is? Alea will go on killing until there's no more killing to be done. For vengeance. Actually, same with Valerian. I mean, at the end there when he's like, yes, this is what it's like to be alive. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's her face again when she looks over and he's like, yes, queen. <laughs> she's like, oh, this is cool. Uh, I hope she talks again, you guys. I know that she started talking because, you know. She thought she was dying. She thought she was dying. But I hope it's just a thing now where she's like, YOLO, I talk. <laughs> She'll be like Kevin Smith. In his movies. Oh my god. Has that one line. Oh my god. Just it's, all of a sudden is like, let me explain some stuff for It's you. profound. There's <laughs> a million beautiful girls in the world. I don't know how to bring you dinner at work. Um, <laughs> we're children of the 90s. Mm. Uh, or teenagers of the 90s. Uh, so, I'm excited for a sequel. I really am. Same. I'm not quite sure where it's going to go. No, but... Maybe it'll be the next time a Primark wakes up. They'll be there for the Phoenix. That's apparently that's what's happening. The Phoenix is rising. Yeah, and if it's... And it's not Jean Grey. That'd be the worst Warhammer cross. That'd be like the worst, worst cross ever. Worst cross ever. <laughs> oh my god. Actually, it would be the best, because they would get purged because they're mutants, and we suffer not the mutant to live. What about the space wolves? Get the fuck out of here. Well, no. Okay. Don't call them mutants, heretic. My computer. I will shut this down. <laughs> I will turn this podcast around. <laughs> um, oh my god. Yeah, pretty much. Um, well, this podcast is not going to win any awards. <laughs> Especially now when we're a little tipsy. Yeah. Talking about Warhammer. Mm -hmm. Um. I am. No, I'm excited for a sequel though. I just. I guess I'm kind of like. And this is a good thing. I'm like. Where do we go from here? I'm curious when's it gonna come? Is it gonna come before or after the last book of the Dark Imperium? I don't know. Are they going to join him? That would be fun. They're gonna get the band back together. together. <laughs> It'd be so amazing. Hey, well. They'll have Gulliman, and you'll have Alea, and you'll have Valerian, so oh, oh. Alarian then? Have Alea meet Father Matthew and kill him. So great. Kilt! <laughs> She'd be like, what happened to Freighter Matthew? Oh, him? He got kilt. Actually, she'd probably just go. <laughs> yeah, she'd just be like, whatever. Um, I don't know. He might, like, choose to be like, oh, lo, the Emperor is with you and catch her on a bad day. And she'd just be like, terrify him. Because, okay, so, all right, the thing I want to okay. talk about, okay. this is the side, this is one of the things that I liked, but I was a little confused. So they talked about Thought Mark, which my understanding is just, like, a really, a much more eloquent version of sign language. That's how I interpreted it as well. Right, which, if you know how to sign, sign language is very basic, right? So I was like, oh, that's kind of nice, but there's that one member, she walks, she's walking through the quarter, the, um, the councilman's quarters, and the one girl is kind of like, gives her the smile, and she gives her like a stunning thought mark. And the girl like takes a step back. That I think is kind of strange. That confused me because it sounds like a psycho thing. It almost does. But it can't be? No. It's the literal opposite of a psycho thing. Which is it just like there's something about the hand gestures that just like shock people somehow, like on a subconscious level? Could be. Is it? Because she does also talk about how, um, and I didn't know how to interpret this, but I've heard this in a couple of other stories with the Null Maidens too, typically by Dan Omnet, where he talks about how they can kind of like, it's like, not like a psychic wave, but they have the Null field, but they can also kind of like project it a little bit or like really amp it up. And, um, so I don't know if it's maybe that. Could be. I guess she was giving him, like, a stun thing. She's basically being like, have a little extra null with that. Um, since, you know, she talks about how, just how violent, every, not violent, but just what a strong reaction people have to her regardless. Right. Right. I thought that was a little strange, that when it happened, it's, oh, I didn't know you could do that. Cool, though. Yeah. 
I'd like to be able to just shut people up with a hand gesture. Do you know how short my meetings would be? <laughs> well, you I mean you could technically do it now, but <laughs> get you fired. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if I start flipping people off in meetings, I'll just get fired. Right. <laughs> or voices will get raised, which have the opposite effect of what I will say for. That I bet there'll be a stunning effect. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I didn't quit one job in particular with flipping everybody off, I would not. Not this one. <laughs> I just need a little sun mark, and I don't even imagine. Can't even imagine. I would like to imagine it was just her, like, <laughs> with her fist, and the girl. <laughs> She's gonna hit me. <laughs> that could have been it too. It honestly, it could have been it. It was just like, oh, that lady's serious, like really serious. Leighton Psyker. I don't know. Nah, nah. I don't know. Then, um, no. Overall, I. The only complaint that I have about this book is that because we've read all these other books that we've read. A, everything that happened, well, not everything, but most of the things that happened, I was like, yep, yep, okay. It was more of like adding color to events that we already knew happened. And I'm not sure if we would have read it in 2017 if we would have been a little, if it would have had a little bit more oomph to it. Because it would have been less of like, ah, yes, this explains now this, this is good color for this. If we would have had a little bit more of, wait, what? And it might have been much more mind blowing if we had read it when it first came out. Yes. Or, I, or right after, not even when it first came out, but right after reading um, Katie's Stance, because I read that before I read Dark Imperium. Right. So. Yeah, I think it would have definitely, one of the articles that we're going to get up on the site is a, because we have the guide of like how to get into Warhammer mm -hmm. 40k, we're going to do one on how to get into this new millennium um, and the order of books to read. And I feel like every book I read, I'm like, okay, put this one at the front. Um, this one, though, does feel like the biggest starting point. I would... Katia stands. Oh. And this. Right. Right there. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I go back and forth on which one to read first. Probably Katia stands. I would say Katia stands. Probably Katia stands, because, yeah, this one definitely... It does... I think this one would have a little bit more effect after your... Oh, yeah, I already know Katia falls. Right. Because right. when they find out about it. Right, because right, if you don't know what's going on on Cadia, you won't understand the, um, I think the emergency, the, or the urgency that everyone is, is has, and uh, I don't think it would be as impactful without already knowing. That's fair. That's fair. So that one, but then definitely this one next. Yes. Definitely. Which is and what then, Random Citizen has been telling us since he first discovered our podcast. He's like, I think we need Bless you. Time. We're like, oh, yeah, we'll get to that. He's like, no, you really need to read Watchers of the Throne. <laughs> yes. And I'm, you know what, totally correct. Really glad we t took a break from our regularly scheduled podcasting to read this book. Yep. Um, this one, we had this big moment where we were talking about Apocalypse, and I was like, oh, wow, this is like the most important lore book that we've read this year. And definitely published this year, yes, Apocalypse stands to be still the most important lore book from yes. this year. This is probably the most important lore book, just in how much color it gives to stuff. And the Again. start of this new uh, Gulliman uh, Imperium. Gulliman led Imperium. Gulliful. Gulliful. Oh, I like that. Gulliful. Mm -hmm. You might say it was a reboot. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I would call it a reboot, which is still better than Rebooté. Guys, nothing will drive me as crazy as Perturabo. Perturabo. You guys, that shook me to my core. I had to stop the audio drama because Perturabo, Perturabo. Because he's perturbed, you see. Don't ruin this for me. <laughs> it's my favorite Primark. So when I'm reading a short story, pronouncing it Perturabo, It triggers her. I keep waiting to see one where they're like, Conrad Kurz. Conrad. Conrad. <laughs> Damn it, don't even do that. Or Tarabo. Rabute. It's like, go watch Buckaroo Banzai if you have like two hours of free time. 
<laughs> you don't have anything better to do, and you want to be confused for two hours. <laughs> Go watch the pictures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension, in which Christopher Lloyd plays a character named Big Bootay, and everybody keeps calling him Big Booty, and he starts yelling, it's a running gag with him, going, it's Big Bootay! I cannot say we're Bootay. All I would picture now is going to be like, is that a Destiny's Child song with Bootylicious? <laughs> podcast with us we apologize <laughs> we're more professional than this i promise a little bit i'm not gonna say like we're totally professional but a little bit we're much more professional we usually don't drink we're not usually in the same room there's that too that's why we're drinking because we're in the same room <laughs> it's how we can tolerate one another <laughs> Okay, so seriously, thank you all for so thank much you. for listening, or actually listening might have been really confusing, so you might want to watch it if you know what I'm saying. You might be a little more sensitive because then you'll be like, dude, they are drunk. <laughs> We're actually not that bad. Like, we drink to remember the Lord. <laughs> I, left my, I lost my notes, so, you know, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Oh, so what are we reading? Oh, yes. we're reading The Devastation of Ball next. Devastation of Ball. Oh. So the reason that we're reading this one next, I feel it's important to say, is because Carrie just realized that Ball is on the other side of the rift, you know, the wrong side of the rift, and she's very, very concerned. So we need yeah. to read it. Well, I have a feeling that even more gets explained. Probably, yes. But we need to read it so that she'll feel better about her blood angels. Feelings. They've got all the feels. <laughs> like everybody's like, ooh, the night lords are so emo. Have you met the blood angels? <laughs> They're vampires that sparkle. <laughs> They're space vampires. <laughs> and they sparkle. And they have feels. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Well, well, we're going to have to edit this part. No, I'm not editing it. Are you kidding me? Forget it. It's too much work. So, <laughs> so we're reading Devastation of Ball by, guess who wrote it? Just guess. It's Guy Haley. <laughs> we're reading that next. Did he really? Are you serious? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Is there a book he does? When does he sleep? Okay, we just read a book he does Sundays. write. Sundays. That's a, there's a movie called Thank You for Smoking, and they ask this one guy, they're like, when do you sleep? And he's like, Sunday. It's Rob Lowe. I forgot about this, that movie. That movie's so great. That's anyway. Right. Anyway, so, <laughs> if you like this podcast, or maybe another one for <laughs> not acting like idiots, um, be sure to like, subscribe, and all of those wonderful things. You can find the vidcast on YouTube and you can find the podcast itself on our website at wh40kbookclub.com or on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and now Stitcher. <laughs> I don't know what that was. I'm excited we're in Stitcher, you guys. All right, so anyway. We're legit. So anyway, stick with us next time as we read from a crag. And apparently drink for the emperor. <laughs>